All right, so the title of this series is uh, Psalms for Beginners. This is lesson one, the introduction to the Psalms uh, themselves. And uh, I want to start by uh, maybe discussing how we're going to approach this. I mean, if you do the math, uh, you know, uh, there are 150 Psalms in the book of Psalms. We have 13 weeks that, no. <laughs> no matter how fast we try to go through them, we wouldn't be able to go through all those uh, Psalms. So we're going to take a bit of a different approach a more overall um, survey of the Psalms. So the three things here that we're going to do in this class, we're going to review the uh, history uh, and the authorship. There are different authors. You know, one thing that a lot of people say all the time, which is not accurate, is David, you know, King David, he wrote the book of Psalms. Well, yes, part of it, but there are other authors uh, in that book and other authors of Psalms throughout the Old Testament. So we're going to look at that, the history. Uh, some of the technical information on Hebrew poetry. In other words, we're going to look at a variety of literary devices that they used in those days to embellish, to strengthen, to highlight the, the psalm itself. Very different from the type of devices that modern day poets use. So we're going to look at that. Also very important to understand the devices because if you understand the devices, it gives you in, insight into what the meaning of the psalm uh, actually is. So we're going to spend some time on that. And then we're going to study uh, each of the nine groups of psalm types. And so if you took all the psalms, they, they fall into categories, types, themes, nine general ones. So we're going to look at the nine different groups of psalm types. And then we're going to focus in on one or two of, uh, of the psalms in each uh, in each type, because we certainly don't have the time to go through all of the, all 150. So the objective here, I always like to have a bit of an objective, a goal, if you wish, uh, for a class. So the objective is that you uh, know, uh, first of all, about the Psalms themselves, that you can understand and differentiate between the types of Psalms. Hopefully by the end you'll be able to say, oh, this is a royal Psalm, oh, this is a praise Psalm. So you'll, you'll know, you know what type of Psalm that you are uh, reading. Also, you'll be able to have a better appreciation of the poetry itself. And uh, because of this, be able to draw more insights. In other words, it'll be more meaningful when you read the Psalms in the future, you'll understand more about what the author is, is uh, saying. And I think that's true for any kind of study, any type of literature, uh, whether it be modern literature or you know, uh, Elizabethan literature, whatever. Uh, when you understand what the poets were doing, the, the, the devices and technical things that they were doing, you also gain an insight into the, the meaning. So let's begin, shall we? with a couple of basic things. Uh, tehilim is the Hebrew for the term praise or praises, the name of the book. It's um, a Greek translation of the word uh, salmoi. In other words, if you go into the Greek, the Greek word is salmoi, and the English word is an anglicized version of this particular word uh, which, it, uh, which becomes psalm. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we recognize, they've done the same thing with the, with the title of the book of Psalms as we, did, uh, as we do with the uh, word baptism. You know how you've probably been in classes where they say, well, the word in the Greek for baptism is baptizo. Well, one form of it anyways, is baptizo. And if you were to translate the Greek word baptizo into English, well, you would get to plunge or to immerse. Uh, when the translators translated that word into the English, they didn't translate it, they transliterated. In other words, they anglicized the Greek word baptizo and it became an English word baptize. Well, they did the same thing with this word here. A Greek word salmoi, instead of translating it to praises, they simply anglicized the word and it became the English word psalm. All right? um, the psalms have, uh, the, the thing about them, the main characteristic is that they have a universal quality. Universal quality. They, 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 they offer comfort without critical understanding. Now in this class, we're going to aim at having some critical understanding of what the author is saying, but even if you never take this class, you can still get something out of the Psalms. They're still, they still speak to people univer, uh, you know, in a universal way. Uh, 
Uh, you don't have to be a scholar to understand, uh, you, know, uh, you don't have to understand Jewish history, you don't have to understand the life of David, anything like that. <laughs> you, you get something out of the Psalms just from a, a surface reading. Uh, the paradox of the Psalms is um, how a book that came from such a narrow-minded culture, like the Jews, and a complex religion, how a book coming from this type of background could have such a universal appeal. There, there's the paradox. The answer is that they speak to every area of the human experience. That, that's why they're so uh, popular, that's why uh, they're universally uh, accepted and loved, uh, because the writers speak to people who have ordinary and common human experiences. And so their appeal is based on several factors in this uh, line of thinking, if you take this line of thinking. Um, uh, first of all, they heighten our sense of worship, satisfying this basic need in all men. In other words, um, um, we use the Psalms in our own worship when our own words fail us. They're, they have better words to praise God than, than we can sometimes think of, no matter what language we speak, and so that's, that's one, of the appeal, uh, one of the appeals that they have. Uh, they're uni universal because they show people who were bold in prayer, people with a, a, an intimate relationship with God in an era when this was not done. Now, at the time when these were written, other nations, these pagan nations, they had no concept of this intimate relationship. They didn't call the Molech you know, their father. They didn't say things about the pagan gods that the Psalms said about God. There was no personal, friendly, intimate, loving relationship between the pagan god and the pagan worshiper. And so this was appealing to people. They saw in the Psalms uh, that the people who believed in that God had a, a tremendous relationship with him, something that they themselves did not have. And so the, the Psalms uh, appealed to people even if they were not uh, uh, Jews. They also contained theological certainty in the presence and in the power of God to rule and to respond to prayer. In other words, the Psalmists never make an attempt to write something in order to prove that God exists. There are no Psalms that do that. They're not apologetic in nature. The Psalms begin with the assumption that God is there. Now, if you don't believe that, then too bad for you. We're not even going to make an effort to try to convince you. They, they start with the assumption God is there. God is in charge. God answers prayers. God is the one who punishes. God is the one who blesses. God is the one who gives victory and, and so on and so forth. Well, that's appealing to people. They, they, that appeals to that certainty of God's existence and the surety of God's presence. That's an appealing feature uh, to, to, um, to other people and to people who read this, uh, the, the Psalms. And also they have um, an aesthetic form that appeals to everyone. Their beauty and grace are timeless. Let's face it, we're in, the, we're in the 21st century, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I mean, I get that. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I get that in the 19th century, I get that in the 17th century, I get that in the 9th century, I get that in my, if I'm a slave, I get that if I'm a noble, I get that if I'm a woman, I get that if, you know, I get it. It has this universal appeal. It doesn't matter what country, what language, what life situation. It speaks to people in a very special, very special way. Written you know, 3, 000, almost 3,000 years ago. What, what other piece of literature from you know, outside the box, what other piece of literature that long ago has an immediate impact on someone you know, 3,000 years later? No translators needed, no explanation needed. You just read it and you go, yeah, I get it. So we understand, we do, we understand by faith that this is because these things, these Psalms are God's work. Uh, 
and they were purposefully given to men and to women, of course, with all of these things in mind. It's not like an accident. It's not like a fluke you know, that, 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 they, that, that there's a heightened sense of worship in here. There's purpose. I mean, the, you know, God inspired man to write these things, to be bold in prayer, to have certainty that God exists, to uh, uh, put these things together in a, in a beautiful aesthetic way that uh, all men, all mankind could appreciate it. So yes, the men were talented. It was men who wrote these were talented, but we believe that they were inspired by God to do these things. All right, so let's do some like critical analysis. Talk about the authorship here. As I said, there's always, sometimes there's, there's an assumption, you know, David wrote the book of Psalms, yes, but he wasn't, the, he wasn't the only one. And I'm going to say this just once so that we don't have to repeat it. We all know that, of course, the Holy Spirit is the author. We get that. But when I say the author, I'm talking about the, the human individual that actually wrote the words down on paper, okay? So different writers of the Psalms, uh, but the Holy Spirit is the author, if you wish. So uh, 2 Samuel 23, 22 says, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. That's David, that's a quote from David, excuse me, not necessarily out of the Psalms, this is a quote from 2 Samuel 23, 2. The point I'm making here is that David was under the impression, was under the understanding that God was giving him material uh, to write. Uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 43, uh, uh, Jesus said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, etc., etc. And so here we see Jesus confirms the inspiration of the Psalms. You know, my, my, my initial point was David and others wrote the Psalms and they were inspired by God to do so. And now what I am doing is, well, where does it say in the Bible? that the Psalms are inspired. Well, Matthew 22, 43, for example. Luke 24, 44, Jesus said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And so Jesus himself was saying to people, to his apostles and disciples, that the book of Psalms written by David, partly written by David, this was inspiration. This was prophecy. Another one, Peter confirms the inspiration of David and the Psalms. In Acts 1.16 it says, brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So here you have Peter the Apostle who is saying that the Holy Spirit inspired David to prophesy concerning the one who would betray Jesus. So David himself says, I'm speaking by the, you know, by the word of the Lord. You have Jesus confirming that David, you have Peter talking about this as, uh, as well in uh, Acts 1.16. One other Apostle Paul also teaches that the entire Old Testament was inspired, including David. That passage, probably a little more familiar with this one, all, all scripture. And of course, when Paul was writing, the New Testament had not yet been compiled. The canon of the New Testament had not yet been compiled. So when, De when Paul is saying all scripture is inspired by God, at the time he's writing that, the all scripture he's talking about is what we know as the Old Testament. And he says, and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training, and righteousness. So Paul teaches that all the Old Testament is inspired, which included the Psalms. So the first point we're making here is that the Psalms, yes, it's in poetic form, but let's not discount the idea that even though it's in poetic form, it's still inspired writing, inspired by God Himself. Um, another point, uh, as a matter of fact, Dayton and I were just talking about that before the class started. Uh, 
Uh, it is quoted from in the New Testament more times than any other Old Testament book. There are 287 quotes in the New Testament that are taken from the Old Testament. 116 of those 287 quotes are taken from the book of Psalms. So it is a very, they're all important, of course, but it is a very important book when it comes uh, to the fulfillment of prophecy in the New Testament. Now we said that there are 150 Psalms in the book of Psalms, but there are more than 150 Psalms in the Old Testament. In other words, not all the Psalms are in the book of Psalms. There are other Psalms you know, located in other, in other places. Uh, the present format of 150 represents a selection process from a larger number of Psalms available and collected under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Originally, Psalms or praises were gathered into smaller collections and they were arranged by the similarity of themes uh, or catchwords or phrases or types or form. You know, they were kind of put together in smaller collections. We know this for several reasons. First of all, in Psalm 72.20, it says that David's psalms are ended. You, know, you read the end of Psalm 72.20 and it says, and, and, and thus are the end of David's psalms. That's Psalm 72, there are no more. But then you keep reading, and then in verse, uh, uh, Psalm 86 is credited to David. Psalm 101 is credited to David. Psalm 103 is credited to David. Psalm 108 is credited to David. What's going on? It's said in 72, Psalm 72, this is it. These are all David's psalms, there are no more. And then it gives credit to David for psalms you know, beyond Psalm 72. So this suggests that two collections were combined and the smaller was included with the larger one. Okay. There are doublets or duplicate psalms in and out of the book of Psalms. For example, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 are the same. Psalm 105 verses one to 15 and 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse, uh, chapter 16 verses 8 to 22, they're the same. So how do you reconcile that? Did they make a mistake? No. This means that different groups had different collections and when they were put together, that's when the duplicates showed up and they did not want to eliminate you know, one psalm from one. You know, they, they, they kept the collections complete. You know what happens, like if you have a coin collection, you've got a, a coin collection, you buy somebody else's coin collection you know, of the types that you're collecting, and then when you put them both together, uh, you know, oh good, I didn't have this one, oh I didn't have this one, oh that, that's, I got two of these now, and I got two of these, oh my goodness, I got three of these, you know. And so when they put the collections of these, you know, a collection of three, a collection of 15, a collection of nine, you know, when they put them all together, all of a sudden they realize, whoa, we, we have doubles here. Also, and these are like they're fact, you know, little facts that I'm giving you about the Psalms. We also recognize that short sets were also used for special purposes, special occasions. The most famous, uh, famous of course, are Psalms 113, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Together, they form what is called the Hallel. They're called the Hallel Psalms because they begin and end with praise the Lord. They start with praise the Lord. You know, the psalm begins with praise the Lord, it ends with praise the Lord. And these psalms, 113 to 18, making up the Hallel, were sung at the three great festivals for the Jews. The festival of dedication, the festival of new moon, and the festival of the Passover. And it's what Jesus sang with the apostles at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, you know, before they leave to go to you know, Mount of Olives, Gethsemane, before they leave to go there, it says they sang a hymn. They sang hymns. They sang the Hallel. That's what they sang. That was the custom of the Jews 
These were the songs or psalms that were recited and sung during the time of the Passover. So if you're curious to know, well, what songs did they sing? What were the words? Well, just go to Psalm 113 to 18 and you'll see. Now they weren't always sung all of them. Sometimes one or two were sung, you know, but these were the ones. Uh, again, these were a separate or smaller collection that were placed in the larger collection. Some Psalms were included in the book of Psalms and others were not. For example, Moses' song of deliverance, Exodus 15 verses 1 to 18, that's a song. When they escaped from the Egyptian army, God saved them in a miraculous way. Moses you know, comes forth with a song of praise or song of deliverance. That's a psalm. It's not in the book of Psalms. It's in Exodus. Deborah, Deborah's song of praise in Judges chapter five, also a psalm written by a woman, but not included in the book of Psalms. David's lament over Saul and Jonathan. David's good friend, Jonathan, dies in battle along with his father, Saul. And David, even though he now you know, becomes king and his greatest enemy uh, you know, has now uh, been killed, he doesn't jump up and down and rejoice. No, no. He makes this lament, a dirge, we call it a dirge over, of course, Saul, but especially Jonathan in 2 Samuel chapter 1, 19 to 27, a psalm, a psalm, actually a type, a psalm of lament, but not included in the book of Psalm. Even though David wrote psalms for that book, this one here didn't make it in. Another example, Hezekiah's praise to God for delivering him from illness, remember that? God gave him an extra 15 years of life. Hezekiah praises God because of this, King Hezekiah. Read this in Isaiah 38, verses 9 to, 9 to 20. And so the process of selecting some and omitting others can be compared to John's statement in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Remember what John says at the end of his gospel? Where he states that only some of the events of Jesus' life were recorded to suit the purpose of the author, which is the Holy Spirit. Same thing happens in Psalms. There were lots of Psalms, lots of songs of praise written by many people, but not all of them were included in the quote, the Old Testament canon. Amazing that John says, you know, Jesus did so many more things and if what was written about him, if we put all that in a book, you know, the world couldn't contain everything. And we understand that, have you ever typed into Google <laughs> Jesus Christ, just Jesus Christ into Google? Are you kidding me? I mean, hundreds of millions. I mean, there's no end to the books and articles and sermons and, you know. I mean, just, I mean, just Bible talk itself, we're closing in on a thousand videos. That's just us, one little, little website. So you can imagine over the period of 2,000 years how much material exists. Now, um, getting back to our study, the book of Psalms for study purposes, not, not by me now, but you know, the way that it's been put together is divided into five sections. And this was probably done to aid studying or to correspond to the five books of the law. Five books of the law, five divisions of Psalms, at the end of each section, there's a doxology. A doxology is a word of praise. They, every section ends with praise, not with a song of lament, for example. It could be a song of lament or a dirge or a other type of psalm, you know, uh, cursing somebody or asking God to, you know, to destroy an enemy uh, among the different types of psalms. But when, when they ended a section, it was always with a, a psalm of, of praise. The five books were divided in the following way. And so Psalm 1 to 41, section one. Psalm 42 to 72, section two. Psalm 73 to 89, section three. Psalm 90 to 106, section four. And Psalm 107 to 150, 
uh, is the fifth uh, section of the book. Okay, so the book of Psalms was written over a period of approximately 1,200 years by a number of writers, authors, even, even David. You know, he didn't sit down one day and say, yeah, I believe I'm going to write a book of poetry, going to knock out 70 or 80, no. A collection of the Psalms that he wrote during different periods of his life, and we'll study that. Some of the Psalms we can pinpoint why he wrote it, when he wrote it, not all but some, uh, some, again, some facts, all introductory facts. Moses has the earliest Psalm, 1400 BC. Psalm 90, only one Psalm credited to him, Psalm 90. David, as we mentioned, was the most prolific of the writers, around 1000 BC. Uh, he wrote Psalm 1 to 41 exclusively, no doubt about that and then another 30 or so that appear after that. So he's the principal writer of the book of Psalms, but not the only one. Solomon, 950 BC, uh, he wrote uh, two or three are credited to him. And then you have Asaph, the sons of Korah, Ethan, Heman, and other unknown authors between the years 900 to 400 BC who also contributed uh, to the book of Psalms. I say 400 BC because by the year 400, I'm not giving the exact year, but by the fourth century before Christ, the Old Testament canon had been put together and it was, it was complete. It didn't change after that, all right? We uh, learn about the, the canon or the, the, the word canon means a measure, okay? And so the books that measured up, the books that belonged to the inspired, you know, the law and the prophets and the history uh, were collected and uh, confirmed as the inspired word of God by the Jews, by those, that group before Christ, 400 years before Christ arrived. And the amazing thing is the Old Testament that we read now is the exact same Old Testament that they read when Jesus was on earth not divided the same way, it's divide, it was divided differently, but it had all the same books, uh, uh, books in it. So these were collected, the Psalms rather, these were collected and included in the Old Testament canon as one single book of Psalms with the 150 Psalms that we now have, uh, and this was done um, you know, many centuries before Jesus appeared. All right, so let's talk about how they're used the book of Psalms was considered the Jewish songbook. Uh, it was used in temple worship, also in synagogue, in the home as a hymnal or as a guide for, um, uh, for devotional purposes. Remember back in those days, you couldn't just go somewhere and buy a book cheap. They didn't have books actually, scrolls, but you know, writing and written material was expensive. And so when you had it, when they had it, this is how they used it. Uh, it was also used in the early church in much the same way. You know, what, what were they singing in the New Testament church in the first century? Well, they were singing what they sang when, before they were converted, because at first the, the Jews, you know, were, it was decades before, the, uh, before Gentiles were preached to. You know, it took almost 10 years before Peter actually went you know, uh, to, to, to see Cornelia. You know, it, it was a decade, so for years the, only the Jews were being preached to about Christ. And when they converted to Christianity, what did, what did these new, quote, Jewish Christians sing? Well, they sang the songs that they already had because they were singing to the same God, okay? Uh, much later on, Martin Luther used the book of Psalms in restoring congregational singing. John Calvin, you know, the, the Calvinist, uh, not the Calvinist church, but John Calvin, the church today would be the Presbyterian church. But there were thousands of congregations of Calvinists uh, at that time, and they were all non-instrumental. They got rid of the instrument 
I mean, it's, sometimes we think in the Church of Christ, we're the ones that rediscovered the idea of non-instruments of music you know, in our public worship. And yes, you know, we, we understood that that was the way worship, New Testament worship should be conducted. And yes, we're known for that. But let, let's, not, let's not get crazy here and think we're the original ones that, <laughs> that came up with that idea. I mean, there were no instruments of music for the first thousand years. There were no instruments at all. It was all a cappella. The instrument was introduced, you know, ninth century, something like that. It became prevalent all the way to, to the Middle Ages. But when the Protestant Reformation started, <laughs> Martin Luther wanted to go, you know, you know what Martin Luther's and the reformers, what was their battle cry? Uh, back to the Bible. Let's just go back to the Bible. And they had varying degrees of success. You know, it's easy for us to judge. We're looking back on them and say, well, they didn't do this. And they, well, you know, <laughs> in those times, it was, a, it was a different time. They were pretty courageous. Many of them were killed because of what they wanted to do. And one of the features of let's get back to the Bible was let's get rid of the instrument. So what do we use then as a, as a songbook? Well, many of them used the book of Psalms. Our songbook today, the songs of the church, there are a lot of variations of song, you know, different editions. But this songbook today, we have 126 songs in our songbook that are listed as being taken from the Psalms. So the, the tradition of using the Psalms in public worship continues to this day, even in our brotherhood. The book of Psalms, of course, is a valuable book because of what it provides for the reader. For example, it's effective to prove the claims of Christ were accurately prophesied in the Old Testament. I read Luke 24, 44. You know, I say it's profitable for apologetics. It wasn't written as apologetics you know, to prove that God existed, but it was used by New Testament writers as apologetics to say, look, this was prophesied in the Old Testament about Jesus. So here it says, now Jesus said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about, in me, about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So Jesus saw the Psalms um, as an inspired source of prophecy about himself. Uh, it also, and we're talking about how the Psalms are used, one way is as, you know, as apologetic, another way, uh, devotional. It enhances our prayer and devotional experience. It helps us to develop a pious and saintly vocabulary and spirit for acceptable worship. In other words, when we're lost for words, to express to God how much we love and appreciate Him, it's a good idea to go to the Psalms and use their words. Thirdly, it widens our appreciation for God. Psalms describes with wondrous praise God's power and glory and wisdom and mercy without embarrassment, without hesitation. The Psalms deepen our knowledge and relationship with God and show us the relationship between thanksgiving and contentment. You know, when we focus on what we don't have, we're dissatisfied. When we focus on what we have and con consistently give thanks for this, we create and nourish this sense of contentment and well-being. And the Psalms provide the language and the understanding for that particular expression of thanksgiving. Fourthly, they teach us the godly response to sorrow and fear and discouragement and anger and disbelief and victory and joy. How should I speak? How should I feel? How should I respond in, in, in my anger or discouragement or whatever? The Psalm provides what ordinary men felt, the same type of emotions as we do and how they express those things to God without fear, not always praise, not always, oh God, you're wonderful. Sometimes it was, how, how dare you? Why have you done this to me? Why me, Lord? Why, why aren't you destroying my enemies? You know, I mean, real human beings talking to a real God. So if you want to know how godly people feel and deal with their feelings, read the Psalms. <laughs> 
In the end, I hope that our study will help us to you know, experience some of the things felt by the writers who expressed in their Psalms the things that they experienced in their relationship with God. And I think as I you know, close out this class, I think that is the number one thing, I, certainly that I get out of Psalms. I, I get to see how ordinary people felt in their intimate relationship or their pursuit of an intimate relationship with God. And it tells me that my feelings are not out of bounds. When I'm mad at God for some reason or other, my feeling is not out of bounds. I got to get over that. I got to figure a way to get out of that. But feeling that way is not so unnatural because others have felt angry with him and disappointed with him and doubted him in the past. And yet you know, they pursued and continued with their faith. Okay, so tonight was just, you know, let's get introduced, some facts, some background. Next week we're going to get into the technical stuff, looking at Hebrew poetry. I think it's fascinating. I think it's, it's a fascinating study and I hope that you do too and you'll be back for another lesson. All right, thanks.